Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, Resurrection Church. Wherever you're at, whenever you're watching this, we just want to say welcome. Uh, and it's such a joy and honor for Shelly and I to be able to uh, invite you into this time where we get to spend together worshiping Jesus in song. And in a few moments, we'll we'll open the scriptures and learn from the scriptures about Christ. But as we get into a time of singing, I just want to uh, share a couple of verses from Psalm 32 to kind of help uh, orient our hearts and our minds as we prepare to worship God. You know, we're in a, we're in a time where it's a unique time and unique circumstances, and a, a lot of you have expressed fear or uncertainty or worry, and we're aware of, of, of those of you in the body who are experiencing sickness and suffering and pain. And we worship a God who is the creator of all things, but he is a creator who doesn't distance himself from creation, but he sympathizes with his creatures. And so I want to invite you to a time of, of rejoicing in a God who is worthy of worship and praise, even in times of difficulty and suffering. And so I want to read these two verses and then we'll get into uh, singing together. It's Psalm 32, uh, verses 10 and 11. It says these words, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And so if you're joining us, um, join us as we rejoice together in Christ. stand before your maker full of wonder full of fear come behold his power and glory yet with confidence strong near for the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the god who bends to bless us with Oh, wow. 
But we worship a God who is aware of our circumstances and is a God who created all things to be good, and yet we know that we live in a fallen, broken world, tainted by sickness and suffering and sin and pain. And in a time like this, we, uh, we are aware of the external brokenness and the external pain. But the scriptures teach us that we also have a problem that is inward, that we don't only see external sickness and, and, and suffering, but we also experience the sickness of the soul, uh, sin in our own hearts. And, and as we experience the weight of our sin and the consequences of sin, uh, we need a hope, a hope that it can carry us through uh, those times of pain and suffering and, and the times where we uh, feel the reality of our own brokenness. And so in this next song, I want to invite you all to cast your gaze on the one who redeems and heals, not only uh, heals us physically, but also heals our souls. And so join us as Shelley leads us in this next song.
as we prepare our hearts and our minds to open up the scriptures and study God's word together, I want us to sing this last song pondering on God's majesty and his majestic power in salvation and redemption. That we worship a God who knows us, who's created us, but also who's entered into human history through the personal work of Jesus and has saved us and ransomed us to himself and has redeemed us by his power. And so as we sing this next song, let us be reminded of God's work of salvation and redemption in our lives. So join us.
Hey, Resurrection Church, Pastor Bubba here. We're coming to you from my home to your home. We're calling kind of this new format of doing services home to home. It's a way for us to connect with each other, spend time together, and uh, we are going to just worship God together like we normally would and be the church together. However, I do want to hear from you, and I'm, I'm going to give you a shout out, and I want you to give us a shout out. And the way that you can do that is we're going to do hashtag RC home to home. And so what you can do is you can just put out a picture that kind of says, here we are, and this is what we're doing and hit hashtag RC home to home. And then that will allow the rest of the church to see you and to hear from you. And so, you know, if you're in like the Auburn, uh, Federal Way, Kent, Des Moines area, Shout out to you. You give a shout out back to us. If you're like over in the, you know, Puyallup, Bonnie Lake area, uh, shout out to you. We want to hear from you. Give us a shout out. If you're in like the Tacoma area, well then this is your shout out. Give us a shout out. We want to hear from you. Maybe you're down in the south end, you know, Lakewood, Parkland, maybe even further south. We want to hear from you. This is your shout out. Give us a shout out. And uh, if you're over on the peninsula, maybe Gig Harbor, Port Orchard, hey, shout out to you. We want to hear from you. So if you would take a photo of what you're doing right now. And I know you're saying like, but we're in our pajamas. That's okay. Uh, Make it appropriate, right? But take a photo of yourself and your family or whoever you're hanging out with and do hashtag RC home to home. And that way we'll be able to connect with each other uh, and really stay connected uh, as, as, as best as we're able given the circumstances. Now, to really help facilitate uh, some greater degree of relationship and connectivity during this time, uh, we're going to be actually inviting you to uh, a few things. One of, one of which is, if you would like some prayer, you can actually text in right now a prayer request. There'll be a you know, a number below, you can text in and uh, we will pray for you. There will be someone who will respond to you in real time and there will be an opportunity for them to pray for you. So if you'd like some prayer, text in, let us know how we can be praying for you as we're here for you. As well, we wanna encourage you to leverage technology. Though we are doing this uh, kind of self-imposed uh, isolation during this season of sickness and suffering, that does not mean we shouldn't connect. In fact, we should connect, and we have uh, a great opportunity given our day to leverage technology. So we would encourage you to jump on Google Hangouts and to connect with people. You can connect with your discipleship group. You connect with some friends. Um, in fact, you could even just like do that, like have lunch with someone, and just they're on their computer, you're on your computer, you're hanging out talking. I know it's not as good as being physically face to face, but it is much better than not seeing people. And so stay connected, do some Google Hangouts, make some opportunities to, you know, really spend time with people. Now, also at this time, we're going to kind of transition our time together and we're going to receive our offering. So we want to say thank you to those of you who give generously and faithfully week in uh, or, or month in and month out or week in and week out. Uh, thank you. You can give online. Uh, you can do that at our website or on our church app. Uh, as well, I know some of you prefer to give via mail or like with a check or something, then send us uh, a check via mail. We'll put the information up on the screen for you to see it. Uh, as well, if later you wanna do that, you can always go to our website and get our address or you can give at the give button on the website. Thank you for being generous. Thank you for being faithful. Uh, as a church, we wanna continue in faithfulness in all ways, including discipleship. I mean, our mission is to go make disciples. Our vision is to impact every city, every neighborhood and every person with the gospel of Jesus. And uh, even though we're kind of in this strange time, we can still be making disciples. We can still be living as disciples. And to try to help you see what that could look like for you, we're gonna actually uh, kind of transition now to a discipleship spotlight. You're gonna actually hear from Drew and he's gonna be connecting with one of the members of our church and you're gonna need to hear how discipleship is happening in their lives. Uh, all right. Hey, Resurrection Church, Drew here. I'm coming to you uh, from my living room. Um, glad to be part of these home-to-home -home gatherings, uh, but I miss you. I miss my church family. I can't wait until we get to gather all together in the same place again. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to take some time to call some folks around the church and just be in community, uh, even if it's over a video chat, uh, and kind of get an update on how folks are doing. So I've got my friend Akeem here on the line with me. Say hey, Akeem. Hello, everyone. Hey, so Akeem, how's things going for you 
Uh, I know you're in college right now. It's a crazy time. How, how are you doing? I've been doing pretty well despite all the chaos. I've had I've had peace do all of it because God has been sustaining me. And so it's, for the most part, I'm doing well. Nice. How's Sharia? Sharia, she, as you know, she's been gone for the past three weeks, but she comes back next week on Wednesday. Super excited to have her back and be yeah. back home and be in a place, a place of love. Yeah. Yeah. Back from our army training. Well, we'll be excited to see her. We'll have to do another Google Hangout video chat on uh, something. Uh, yeah, man. Future. No more face to face contact. Six feet away. Or right. Yeah. 20 At miles, least. 20 miles away. That's safe. <laughs> right. To come up to Dupont is far enough away, I think. Hey, so what does being a disciple who makes disciples, who makes disciples look like for you during this time? Yeah. So I'm looking to do a home group this Sunday. And I think that'd be an excellent way of being able to commute with fellow believers, especially in the immediate area. And I think that takes a lot of intentionality because it, it doesn't, it shouldn't just stay there on, on Sunday. We should be going through our weeks and spilling over this goodness that God has given us into other people's lives. So it, for me, it, it's starting a home group for Sunday and being able to uh, constantly reaching out to friends throughout the week and making time to maybe doing a Google Hangout or even having some face-to-face -face contact if they're healthy. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Uh, before, before I let you go, how has God been encouraging you during, during the last couple of weeks? So I've had a lot of quiet time, downtime to reflect, and I've been encouraging all that because God has really showed me the vulnerability of life but also the preciousness of it each moment counts and it's not always about the future just some job or some opportunity that's out there and it's not even about the past about the mistakes that you've made or how the past has maybe negatively affected you or how good it's been but we're living in the now and the now is what makes the past and the now is uh striving towards the future i think it's really cool being able to see god in the midst of right now yeah, that's so good. That is encouraging because that's true. I mean, not only for individuals, but it's true for us as the church, too, that we're not only the church, you know, a few weeks ago when we got together together. And it's not just that we'll be the church in a few weeks or whenever we get to gather together in person again, but we are still the church now. We are still disciples and make disciples and make Jesus known right now. And so uh, thank yeah. you. That's encouraging to me. Hmm. Okay, so. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll catch you later. I'm going to let you go, but we're going to toss it over to somebody else who's going to read our scripture reading for today, and then we'll dive into the sermon with Pastor Bubba. See you later. See you later. Hi, Resurrection Church. We're Paul and Tammy Warbaugh. Uh, we're worshiping together with you from our house in Gig Harbor, and Tammy is going to share the scripture passage today. I'm reading from Romans 3, 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your grace and mercy and love. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to do a work of rescue, redemption for us. Jesus, we just acknowledge you as the Christ, the anointed one, our savior. You lived without sin, died for our sin, rose from the grave. You alone are able to give redemption and salvation. We give you praise and honor and glory. Holy Spirit, we ask that as we spend time in the word today, you would open up our minds and hearts to receive this truth, that it would go deep, deep, deep into our hearts. We need to hear from you, God. 
I pray that you would speak to each of us, you would build us up, you would encourage us, and that we would find ourselves rejoicing in Jesus. We would find ourselves filled with hope. We would find ourselves strengthened to continue to live boldly for Jesus. We pray all of this in Jesus' good name. Amen. Well, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I lived in Oklahoma, and uh, I lived in a small town when I was around the age of 12. And I remember this time where my friend Brian and I, we were actually, you know, walking through town, a couple 12-year-olds, and we were walking down the street. And as we were walking down the street, we saw this, uh, this little building, you know, and, and, it, and we had walked past that building probably, I don't know, dozens of time, not times, and it never noticed it, never noticed this building before. But on that particular day, for some reason, we noticed this building. And it was a, a small building. It was probably, you know, like eight feet tall, and it was a square. It was, a, it was made out of cinder blocks. So it was literally just like a little square, a 10 foot by 10 foot square made out of cin- cinder blocks, and it was painted baby blue. So it was like kind of like bright baby blue, this square building. And as we're walking by it, I saw the building. I'm like, have you ever seen that building before? And he's like, no, I don't think I've noticed it before. I'm like, what is it? What do you think? What do you think that is? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, you want to find out? He's like, of course. Now here's what was interesting is the building had a door, but it didn't have any windows, no windows. So we're like, okay, well, let's try to see if we can get inside this building. So we go over to the door and we're like, you know, pulling on the doorknob and trying to get it open. But you know, that didn't work. It's the door's locked. And so we're just thinking, okay, well, what are we going to do? You know, we, we got 12 year old logic. So we're thinking, okay, let's climb on top of the building, right? Door didn't work. 12 year old logic. Let's get on top of the building. So that's what we do. We climb on top of the building. And as we get on top of the building, we actually find that there is a metal grate on the roof. So it's like, you know, like a two foot by two foot metal grate that you can see through. And as we got on top of the building, we're looking down in this metal grate. And as we're looking down in the metal grate, uh, we realize that there is, there's something in the building, right? What was in there? Dogs, dogs. This little building was filled with dogs, all these little puppy dogs and these just dogs and they see us and we see them. And as they see us, they start barking. They're barking and we're looking down and we're like, what are you dogs doing? You know, and they're barking at us and we're kind of having this exchange. And I'm looking at my friend, I'm like, what, you, what is this? What is going on here? And, and we start to talk about, well, maybe this is like the, the, the doggy prison, right? Like this is like, I don't know if it's the pound, but maybe it's the place that they take the dogs before they go to the pound, or I don't know, maybe this is the place they take the dogs before they, you know, are gonna like put them to sleep or something. We're not quite sure. We just know it's a little building and there's a bunch of dogs in it. And we realize these dogs should not be in this building. This is not right. So I look at him and I say, hey, what do you think about trying to break these dogs free? You think we could do that? I'm like, what, what, we just, it's between us, you know, there's just this metal grate between us and these dogs. What do you think? You think we can do it? And he's like, yeah, let's go for it. So we find a big stick and we take that stick and we try to like, you know, bend the grate, but it doesn't work. The stick breaks, doesn't work. So we find a big rock and then we're like smashing the grate with the rock, but that doesn't work. And then, you know, after like 15 minutes, he says, you know, my, my grandma lives close by. She's got a bunch of tools. Let's like go over to her house and find some tools. Okay. Let's do that. So we go grab some tools, we come back, and then we're able to like unscrew the bolts of the metal grate, and then we take the metal grate off. And then one of us jumps down inside the building, and we start grabbing dogs and tossing them up, grabbing dogs and tossing them up. And then we grab them and put them down, grab them and put them down. And within minutes, we're able to get all of these dogs out of the building, get them out onto the ground, and they are free. We freed all the dogs and we then, you know, ourselves kind of get off the building. We jump off the the building. We're on the ground. We're walking around and we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. We're like, look what we've done. You know, we like freed these dogs. And uh, in that moment though, we realize, well, that's, I guess this is kind of a criminal act. We maybe need to get out of here. So I'm like, okay, let's get out of here. And uh, we start to walk off, right? So we're, you know, we're walking off from the building and what happens? The dogs start following us. And we're like, this is not good, right? Like these dogs are evidence of what we just did. We can't have this. So then we start running. We're just like running away. And the dogs, of course, are just like chasing after us, thinking that, you know, it's like a game or something. And uh, it was crazy. It was crazy. Now, you may be wondering, like, why are you telling me this story? I I want you to understand that that as those dogs were stuck in that, that dog pound, that little puppy prison, whatever it was, we are stuck. We're stuck in sin. 
And this is a problem. In fact, Paul talks about it in the verses that we're looking at today. Let's look at kind of verse 22 into verse 23 and see what Paul says. Paul says, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? We've all sinned. You and I, we are sinners by nature and choice. We've all sinned. And this is a problem. It's, it's actually quite bad. Um, if you recall, last week we looked at kind of the first part of chapter 3, and we saw Paul talking about sin and how destructive it actually is for us. And he said, he was talking, you know, saying, look, you're kind of under sin, and you, you sin with your, your, your thoughts, and uh, you sin with your uh, desires, your heart, you sin with your words, you sin with your actions, uh, you, you sin even in your relationships, that, that sin is, you know, infected and affected every, every aspect of our life. We've been tainted by sin. And I want you to just recall what he said so we can just get a picture of the problem because the problem is sin and it is quite a bad problem. So let's go back to Romans chapter three and look at verses 10 through 18 for just a moment. Paul says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongue to deceive. The venom of asp is, is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Here we see that not only are we sinners, not, not only have we all sinned, but we see that sin is really kind of negatively impacted all aspects of our life. That's what he's saying here. He's saying sin is a problem. It is a, it is a, a pretty bleak picture when we think about it, right? But what is the result of sin, right? We know we sin, but what is the result of our sin? Let's look back at verse 23. If we look at, at, at verse 23, he says, you know, for all have sinned, that's what we've done. Now here's the result, and fall short of the glory of God, right? Because we sin, we have failed to live the kind of lives that God wants us to live. We, we, we've sinned, but even more pointedly, we've sinned against God. Not only have we dishonored God, but we've sinned against God himself, right? Personal sin against a personal God, and God takes it personally, right? It's, it's, it's very bad. And I want you to understand that what this means is that we are not right with God, right? Because of our sin, we are not right with God. I don't think I can overemphasize how terrible that is. And there are two things that happen because of our sin, right? Here's the first one. The first one is this, right? Sin separates us from God, right? Sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, two talks about this. It says, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. That our sin against God has caused us to be relationally cut off from God, right? There's kind of this classic illustration that helps us understand what this means. And I'd like to show it to you now. It's kind of this, this illustration of a, of a chasm, right? On, on one side, what we see are sinful people. And on the other side, we see God who is holy. And what happens is, is because of our sin, we are separated from God. We're not able to have fellowship with God. We're not able to do relationship with God because of our sin. Sin separates us from God, and that is terrible. But there is another thing that happens because of our sin. And so here's the second thing we need to understand. Number two is that sin makes us guilty before God. Right? Sin makes us guilty before God. We see this in James 2.10. It says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it guilty of all of it, right? So when we sin, our sin not only cuts us off from relationship with God, but in our sin, we find ourselves guilty from, from, from breaking God's law. Even one small, tiny, little bitty sin means that you're guilty before God, right? We're all guilty before God. Now, the Bible says that the wage for sin is death, which means because we have sinned against God, we deserve death, physical death, 
and we deserve eternal death. We deserve to be separated from God forever. We would call that hell. When you think about the, the illustration of the chasm, what that means is that, you know, we're sinners and God is holy and we're separated from God. And between us and God is this reality that what we deserve is death and hell. Now, when you hear that, you, you immediately start to go, but, but, but can't we do something about this? Like, this is pretty terrible. Yes, it's terrible. Some people would say, well, can't we do something? Like, what about our morality, right? Like, what about our morality? I mean, what if, I'm, what if I try really hard to just be, you know, moral and ethic? Can I somehow bridge the gap? Can I, can I get me to God? Can I, can I close that distance? No. No. Other people might say, well, you know, what about good works? Like, what if I do a bunch of good works? Can I somehow do good works and, and make myself right with God and bridge the gap? No. You know, other people would say, well, what about religion? Now, now, false religions will tell you that if you do the right things, you can make yourself right with God. But those are false religions. That's not true. It's not what the scriptures teach, right? There, there is nothing we can do to make ourselves right with God. We need to understand that because of sin, we are separated from God. And because of sin, we are guilty before God. And there's nothing we can do to change that. We can't do anything to change that. You know, when I, I thought about those, those dogs, right? Those cute little dogs. And when we were up on top of the, of, the, of, the, of the doggy prison and we were looking down into, you know, below and seeing them in there. And I noticed like there wasn't any water in there. There wasn't any food in there. It was just like these sad little dogs inside this, this, this little prison. And in that moment, you know, my little 12 year old heart was, was crying out like, this is not right. Right? Someone needs to do something about this. Now, the thing is that the dogs could not do it, do anything to free themselves. Right? They, they needed someone to help. They needed someone to intervene. And like those dogs, we need to understand that we can't do anything to deal with our problem of sin. This issue that we are separated from God and guilty before God. Like We can't do anything about that. We need someone to help. We need someone to intervene. We need someone to make things right. Now, here's the good news. Not only does God want to make things right, God actually does something to make things right. All right, so in today's section of scripture, what we see is God doing this amazing, wonderful work to make things right. How does God make things right? Let's, let's jump back into verse 21. And we're going to start there and kind of work through it. It says in verse 21, But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Here we see that this is speaking about the righteousness of God. And, and what we see here is it's saying that the righteousness of God has been manifest. Now, what is the righteousness of God? Well, the righteousness of God is God's righteous character, but even more than that, the righteousness of God is revealed through the person and work of Jesus, who is the righteousness of God in the flesh, right? He's the righteousness of God in the flesh, and the law and the prophets bear witness to Jesus. They ultimately point to Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, now, what did Jesus do to show the righteousness of God? Let's go back to verses 23 and 24. Remember, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. But then we get to the, the good news in verse 24. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to notice in verse 24, the word redemption, right? Notice this word. This is an important word. It is, it's like one of those words that's just loaded with all kinds of deep theological meaning. I would encourage you in your Bible, underline this word. It's one of those words you want to highlight. You want to remember this word. You see, the idea of redemption is, re redemption is when you are freed or liberated or rescued out of bondage and slavery, right? When, when my friend Brian and I freed those dogs, that was an act of redemption. That's what we were doing. We were, we were liberating them. We were freeing them. When we think about biblical redemption, 
we see that this, this, this idea of biblical redemption kind of goes all the way back to the, the story of God's people in Exodus. And what we see in the story of God's people in Exodus is that God's people, they were enslaved. They were in bondage under the, the rule of a terrible tyrant named Pharaoh. And God raised up a mediator, someone who was kind of you know, like a redeemer, to go and help Moses. And God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and God gave Moses a message for Pharaoh. So Moses goes to Pharaoh, he goes to Pharaoh and he says, look, Pharaoh, God told me to tell you this. God says, let my people go. That's what God says. But Pharaoh, he wasn't having it. He was a proud man, his heart was hard, and he would not let the people go. And so God, he acted against Pharaoh. There was uh, discipline that happened through the se a series of plagues that took place. And this exchange kind of happened again and again and again, where Moses would go and he'd say, let, let the people go. And Pharaoh would say no, and then there would be something terrible that would happen. And it kind of ultimately culminated in God's wrath being poured out on Egypt because of the sin of Pharaoh and the Egyptians in that they, were in, they, have in, they had enslaved the people of God. And so what happened is, you know, God told Moses, he said, my wrath is going to pour out against them and there's, they're going to they're experience death. That the firstborn son of each family in Egypt is going to die. And then God told Moses, but I want you to tell the people of Israel that there's a way for, for them to uh, experience some, some, some redemption in this moment from this impending doom. And so what the people were supposed to do is they actually made a sacrifice of a lamb and then they took the blood of the lamb and they painted it on their doorpost. And as they painted the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, that signified this sacrifice that had, had been made to atone for their sins. And so then the wrath of God passed over that house, passed over that doorpost, and they did not experience death. Whereas those who did not have any kind of atoning sacrifice on their behalf experienced death, the wrath of God in their house. And this was, this was a way for God to just demonstrate his, his anger against Pharaoh. When this happened, it broke Pharaoh and he, he decided to let the people go and the people started to leave. But then Pharaoh changed his mind. He got his army together and he went after the people to try to destroy the people. At that point, God does a miracle, opens up the Red Sea. The people are able to travel on dry ground across the Red Sea into the wilderness where ultimately they were, they were free to worship God. And in this story, what we see is God doing an amazing work of redemption and along the way, God had to, you know, he had to do some stuff to atone for sin and also, you know, free the people from the bondage they were experiencing. You see, as sinners, we are enslaved to sin. And like those dogs that were locked up in the pound, you know, they were unable to escape we're unable to escape our sin. Like we can't escape this bondage that we have in sin, which is why we need redemption, right? Is, is redemption possible? Yes, right? Praise God. How is redemption possible? Look back at verse 24. If we look at verse 24, it says, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption happens in Jesus. That's what we're told here. Jesus is the anointed one. He is our redeemer. Jesus is the one who does a great work of redemption. And in doing so, he frees us from the bondage of sin, but he also makes it possible to bridge the gap. Right? Think back at that, that illustration of the chasm. And what we see is that we're sinful people and God is holy and we can't have relationship with God. But what happens is through the, the cross of Christ, Jesus bridges the gap. He does a, a powerful work in order to make it so that we can have fellowship with God. And he does something also to deal with our guilt before God. Right? This, this is the work, the atoning work of Jesus. How does he secure our redemption? Again, look at verse 24. In verse 24, it says that we are justified by his grace as a gift. Right? We are justified. Right? Justified. Again, this is one of those words that is just so theologically 
robust, and dense. You underline this word in your Bible, justified, right? Justification is what theologians also, also refer to this idea as. It's justified and justification. And what we need to realize is justification has to do with our legal standing before God, right? Remember, I told you that sin separates us from God. And sin makes us guilty before God. And justification deals with our guilt before God, which affects our standing before God in our relationship with God. Now, in the book, Systematic Theology, Wayne Grudem gives a good definition of justification that I think is worth noting. It's helpful. So I want to share that with you. This is what he says. He says, justification is an instantaneous legal act of God in which God... Number one, he thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. And number two, he declares us to be righteous in his sight. So when you think of the idea of justification, there are really a few things that happens, right? We see that justification means that we are forgiven as well. Jesus's righteousness is given to us and God declares us to be righteous. These are the things that happen in the work of justification. Now, I want you to think about this uh, in these terms, okay? So, so imagine this, okay? Imagine this, if you will. Imagine it's the day of judgment, okay? It's the day of judgment, and you are standing in the courtroom of God. So it's the day of judgment, and you're in the courtroom of God, and you're standing before the great white throne of judgment. And Jesus the risen Lord Jesus is sitting on the throne. He's sitting on the throne, high and exalted. He is in beauty and glory in majesty. Just, just being in his presence and seeing the throne and him on the throne, it sends chills down your spine. There is reverence and awe as you stand before the great white judgment throne of Jesus, who is the judge. And you're standing there before Jesus, and it's time for you to give an account. And there are books that are open. Someone brings a book, and they open up a book, and this book has everything about your life in it, everything about your life, right? It's got everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever desired, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done. It's got it all in there, even your secrets, all your secrets, everything is in there. And the, they start to read out loud these things. And, and as they do, this account is being given and it's, it's being shown really what has happened in your life. And all of your sins are revealed. Everything is revealed. And as you hear those things spoken, and, 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 and it's just like the evidence is stacking up, stacking up, stacking up against you. As that's happening, you start to realize something, that, 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 that you are emphatically, completely, clearly guilty. You're guilty. And you, you feel the, the guilt deep, deep in your heart. And as that's happening, you start to feel the, just the weight of your sins upon you, and it starts to crush you, and, it, and, it, and it's so heavy, your stomach starts to twist and turn, and then the shame of your guilt comes upon you, and it causes you to look down at the ground. Right? You can't even look up at Jesus anymore. You're just ashamed. You're looking down at the ground, and as you're looking down at the ground, you feel dread, you feel hopelessness, you feel despair. You know that there's no defense, there's nothing you can say, there's nothing you can do. You're guilty and you know it. And you're just you're just you're just there like oh. oh. And you're expecting in that moment for the judge to bring down his gavel to say guilty. Right? Guilty. You deserve death and damnation and that's what you'll get. That's what you're expecting. And in that moment, when it seems that all hope is lost, something happens. Something unexpected happens. The judge starts to bang his gavel. And then he says, here is my judgment. You are righteous. And you're standing there 
and you hear those words, you are righteous. And as you hear him say, you are righteous, you look up, what? What? Me? What? You, you, you know what I've done. You and I, we both know what I've done. And then he looks at you and he says, yes, yes, but do you know what I've done for you? I've made you righteous. And as he says that, everybody in, in the courtroom starts to, to talk and chatter. And they're like, they're like, what, what? Can he do that? Can he, can he do that? Is that okay? Can he do that? And you're like, well, I mean, he's God. I mean, I, I, I think he can do whatever he wants. But they're like, that, that seems shocking. And then all of a sudden, the judge stands up. And as he stands up, he says, people, hear me. Hear me. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? He says, God is the one who justifies. No one has the right to condemn. Only God has the right to condemn. And then as he says that, he, say, he, he says, today's verdict has been made clear. And he looks at you. And in that moment, your, your eyes connect. And he looks right at you and he says, Friend, you are forgiven. And as he says that, immediately the, the weight of all your guilt just, it lifts. It lifts right off of you, right in that moment. And, and in that moment, your heart is just set free in that moment. Right, all the, all the guilt and shame, the weight that has been pressed upon you, it just, it's gone. It's gone immediately. It's gone, right? And, 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 and you experience something you've never experienced, experienced before. No shame, right? None. And, and in that moment, when your shame is gone, you realize no shame, no fear, no dread. All you have is, is peace and joy and love. Your heart is filled with peace and joy and love in that moment. You see, the justification of Jesus, it makes things right. When we talk about justification, we're talking about how it deals with our our separation from God and our standing before God, both of those things. You know, through justification, no longer are we separated from God. Instead, we have fellowship with God. As well, through justification, no longer does God see us as guilty sinners. Instead, God sees us as redeemed, forgiven saints. Now, how is this possible? Okay, let's, let's go back to, 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 to Romans. And look at, let's look at verses 25 and 26. It says in these verses, whom, speaking of Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In these verses, we see the twist. We see the twist. Not, not only is Jesus the just judge, but Jesus is the one who is just, but he's, he's also the justifier. That's the twist. Is that the judge is the one who justifies. Now, as I mentioned before, that because of our sin, we deserve death and wrath. And it brings up an interesting question, right? How can God punish sin and at the same time forgive sinners? How is that possible? Well, the answer is through the cross of Jesus Christ. That's how. The cross is the place where the justice of God and the mercy of God come together and meet. And we see this here in verse 25. All right, look at verse 25 again. It says, God put forward, speaking of Jesus, so God put forward Jesus as a propitiation by his blood. 
Right? That word propitiation, again, very important. Right? Circle that word in your scripture, in your Bible, right? Circle it, circle it. Now, this word propitiation, here's what it means. It means a sacrifice that bears God's wrath to the end, and in doing so, changes God's wrath towards us into favor, meaning it's a sacrifice in which it takes the wrath of God and then turns it into favor. And it, just, it takes the wrath and I guess gives favor is really a, probably a more clear way of saying it. Now, in some of your Bible translations, it won't actually use the word propitiation. Like in the NIV, instead of saying propitiation, it says uh, sacrifice of atonement. That's what it says in the NIV. I like the NIV and, and, and I'm for the NIV. This is one of those places though where the ESV's translation in my opinion, is superior uh, because of the kind of the, the meaning and the weight that is, goes along with this word propitiation. Yes, Jesus is our sacrifice of atonement. He died in our place for our sin, making atonement for us. Yes, absolutely. But propitiation shows us that even in that act of being a sacrifice of atonement, there was more to it than just dying, that he took the wrath of God so that we could receive the, the grace of God and the mercy of God, that that's what was happening there in that moment. So think of it this way, okay? When it comes to this idea of propitiation, think about it like an umbrella, right? Can you imagine an umbrella? What happens with an umbrella? If you have an umbrella, you say you're holding an umbrella and it's up above you and the rain pours down on the umbrella, but then the umbrella, it, it makes the, the rain kind of turn away. It, tur it turns away the rain so that you're under the umbrella and you're dry. You're dry. You don't get any rain on you. Well, that's kind of the way that propitiation works. Jesus is like an umbrella. And as the wrath of God pours down like rain, the wrath of God pours down on Jesus. And Jesus, it, he covers us. He covers us. And when we are in Christ, then we are covered by Christ. And the blood of Christ justifies us. And what happens is instead of us getting wrath, Jesus gets wrath. And then the wrath of God is turned away from us. So we don't receive wrath. We receive grace. That's what happens. Now, what's interesting is that this idea of propitiation is not new to Paul, nor is it new to the New Testament. We actually see this in the Old Testament. And we find it in Exodus chapter 25. What, 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 what you see in Exodus 25 is God talking about the Ark of the Covenant and how on the Ark of the Covenant, there was on top, kind of on the lid of it, something called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is where we find this idea of propitiation in the Old Testament. You see, the mercy seat was considered the place where God and his people would meet together. And the significance of this was, was really seen in uh, the Day of Atonement. What would happen on the Day of Atonement is that uh, the high priest would, would, would come and oversee a special ceremony, and there would be sacrifices that were made. And these sacrifices were made for the, the sins of the people. And then the high priest would take the blood, and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And as he did that, as he was sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat, he was doing that to, to really make a sacrifice to, to satisfy the wrath of God on behalf of the people of Israel. And so what happens is God's wrath is satisfied, the people's sins are atoned for, and then God is able to, to meet with his people in covenant relationship and to continue covenant relationship. And this is all signified through this, this uh, ritual that took place on the Day of Atonement but what we need to understand is that the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant was really a foreshadowing of the cross. You see, in Romans chapter 3, the Greek word that is translated as, uh, into English as propitiation, that word in Greek is the same word that's used in the Hebrew for mercy seat. You're going, oh, okay, mercy, mercy seat, okay. The, the N-E-T Bible, which is the New English trans trans translation, I think captures this really well. This is what it says in uh, verse 325. It says, God publicly displayed him, that is Jesus, at his death, talking about the cross, as the mercy seat accessible through faith. And what we see here happening is that um, instead of using the word propitiation, it's using the word mercy seat. 
And these two, these two words are synonymous. They, they go together. They're, 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 they're talking about the same idea, the same idea. Just as the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant was the place in which sacrifice was made to take, you know, take, take the wrath of God and atone for the sins of the people, the cross is the place where sacrifice is made to take the wrath of God and atone for the sins of the people. And what takes place is that as this happens, we see the, the justice of God and the mercy of God coming together. Now, why did, why did God make Jesus be the propitiation, right? Why did he put Jesus forward as a propitiation? Let's, let's look at verses 25 and into verse 26. We'll kind of look at the end of verse 25. It says this, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, what this is telling us is that the work of justification through the cross of Jesus is a declaration of God's righteousness, right? Through justification, God reveals his righteous character and he also reveals that Jesus himself is the righteousness of God in the flesh, and he also does a work to redeem us so that he can declare us righteous. All of these things happen at the cross. All of these things take place in justification. And so think about it. A God who does not punish sin is not just and righteous, but a God who does not forgive sin is not loving and merciful. And so what does God do? Well, God the Father sins God the Son. And so God the Son takes on flesh to come and live among us as one of us. But unlike us, he lives a perfect sinless life. And then he's able to go to the cross and be a perfect substitute, atoning sacrifice. And he dies on the cross in our place for our sin. And as he dies for us, he pays the penalty for our sin. But he also absorbs and takes the wrath of God that we deserve upon himself. And in doing so, he, 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 he makes it so that we don't get what we deserve. Instead of getting wrath, we get mercy. We get forgiveness. We get freedom from sin. All of this happens at the cross. And then Jesus is buried and as his body went into the grave, the guilt of our sin is buried with him. The shame of our sin is buried with him. And we know that on the third day, he rose from the grave. He died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose conquering sin and death, proving that he is our redeemer, that he alone is the one who is able to justify us. Right? And this is the good news of the gospel. Now, if you're hearing this and you're saying, wow, like, I've never heard that before. Like, that's the first time I've ever heard about, like, why Jesus died on the cross and what that means for me. Maybe you're hearing this for the, for the first time. Right? I, I want you to understand that this, this is an invitation for you. It's an invitation for you. Right? You need justification. Right? You're separated from God because of your sin. And you're guilty before God because of your sin. And there's nothing you can do to make yourself right with God. But the good news is that Jesus has done everything for you. We want to invite you to faith, right? To believe in Jesus and then receive the gift of God's grace, the gift of redemption and justification. You know, you see, without Jesus, what do we get? We get condemnation. But in Jesus, what do we get? We get justification. This is why the Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? So if you're in Christ Jesus, know that that truth is for you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's the heart of the matter, friends. Because Jesus is our just justifier, we can be made right with God. Right? Because Jesus is your just justifier, you, you can be made right with God. 
Right? Sin separates us from God and makes us guilty before God. But Jesus' atoning work on the cross brings us into fellowship with God and turns us from being someone who's seen as a guilty sinner into someone who's declared to be righteous in Christ and forgiven. Right? The, the, the power and the beauty of justification. I want you to just sit for a moment and meditate on this, this idea of justification. If you do that, what you will find is that your heart will start to delight with this truth and delight in this truth and be thankful for the, the justifying work of Jesus. So let's do an, an exercise, okay? Let's do an exercise. It might be a little bit uncomfortable, but, but I'm going to ask you to just, just go with me on this. Think about your sin for a moment. But don't just think about your sin. I want you to think about your worst sin. I want you to think about the worst thing that you've ever done. I want you to think about the things that you've done that you're ashamed of. The things that you have done that if you could go back and kind of erase your past, you would say, yeah, that's, that's, that's getting erased. The things that you don't like to talk about, you don't like to share. I want you to think about the worst sins of your life. Now just feel, feel the feeling of that. And right? if you're like me, you're probably going, oh man, it probably, probably starts to make you feel a little downcast. Now I want you to think about your worst sins in light of justification. Right? Think about them in, in light of justification. Whatever wrath you deserved for your sin, that wrath was placed on Jesus at the cross, which means God is not angry with you. Because his anger has already been dealt with. He's not angry with you. As well, whatever guilt you should have over your sin, your guilt has been dealt with at the cross of Jesus. And what that means is that God is not holding your sin against you. In Christ, you've been forgiven, and God chooses to see you as forgiven. Wow. Think about that. No longer are you a guilty sinner. You are now in Christ, a forgiven, redeemed, justified saint. How does that make you feel? If you're like me, it, it, you find yourself probably going... <laughs> Praise God. Like, praise God. And you find yourself just kind of delighting in the powerful, beautiful work of the cross. You know, I, I want you to understand the power of the gospel. We're told early on in the book of Romans that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And now we find out that it's the power of God for salvation through justification which leads to redemption. Oh, how beautiful is that? And so here's the question I'm asking you. This will be our discipleship group question. Uh, the question is, how has the justification of God brought hope into your life? Right? How has the justification of God brought hope into your life? As you think about your sins, but you think about them in light of justification, you start to see how hopeful this reality of justification truly is. So ponder this this week. Right? When you think about like your guilt, your shame, your fear, and then you, you think about those things through the lens of justification, you start to realize just how much hope there is for us. I want you to not only think about these things, but I want you to actually express them. First, I want you to express them to God. All right, so here's the faith step this week. I want you to take some time, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. You've got your, your, your Gospel Life uh, journal, your workbook, and I want you to just open that up and take some time, and I just want you to, to, to write a, a note of thank you, a note of gratitude to God. God, thank you for justification. And just thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross and taking the wrath that, that I deserve. And make it personal, right? Make it real personal. God, I have hope 
in, 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 in your justifying work because you've taken away this sin and you've changed me in this way and you've freed me from this place of bondage. Make it personal. Let that be just a, a time for you to, to, to worship God and to celebrate God and to rejoice in who God is and what he's done for you. But then after you've communicated your gratitude to God, I want you to communicate your gratitude to someone else, right? To, to, to share with your discipleship group or maybe your home gathering or with some friends how you have hope because of the justification of God. Right? I know you might be saying, well, well, how am I supposed to do that? I mean, if we're on this kind of self-imposed quarantine, I'm not really seeing people like I normally would. Well, just be intentional. Right? Call somebody. Right? Say, hey, I'd love to connect with you. Let's do a Google Hangout. Let's see each other face-to-face and spend some time together. You know, you get, with, get with your group in a virtual Google Hangout. Right? If you can't physically be there, you can be there through technology. I mean, I know it's not as, you know, as good as physically, personally being there, but it's better than not being there. And what, what you will find is that as you make a connection with others, that also, it ministers to your heart and your soul. And as you spend time with them, make it intentional. Hey, I was spending some time meditating on the justification of God. I was writing out some, some notes of just my gratitude to God, and I found myself so hopeful I want to share with you the hope that I have. Have have you experienced this hope? Minister to each other. Disciple one another. Build each other up. Christian, Christian, hear me in this. You are justified. You're justified. Believe it. Trust it. Live it. You are justified. This means you have assurance in Christ. Nothing to fear. No shame. Assurance. Your standing before God is secure. There's nothing you can do to change that. Jesus has said, you are righteous because I've made you righteous. And he's declared not guilty. And that will never, ever change. So let that truth go deep into your heart. Let that truth transform you. Right? Let, let that truth inspire you to experience gospel life. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your powerful work of justification through the cross of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, we give you praise and honor and glory. Thank you for being willing to lay down your life in our place for our sin. Thank you for being willing to take the wrath we deserve so that we get the grace and mercy we don't deserve. We thank you, Jesus, that you are just, you are the just judge, and you are the just justifier. We thank you that you are able to make us forgiven. Just this spiritual reality that we're forgiven in Christ, that we're set free from the bondage and and slavery of sin in Christ. This is what we need. This is what we need to hear. And so Jesus, we thank you for who you are and what you've done. And we ask Holy Spirit, empower us to, to not only believe this truth, but to live this truth. Empower us to to be secure in our identity in Jesus and then to live out of that identity, forgiven, righteous, redeemed, saint. We pray all of these things in Jesus' good name. Amen. Well, friends, at this time, we're going to respond together. And we're going to do that first through communion. Communion is a time for us to remember Jesus, specifically to remember the cross of Jesus. It's a place where we can go and receive the elements, and in the receiving of the elements, we get to spend some time with Jesus and connect with him. And so in your gathering, wherever you are in your home, we want to invite you to, in a moment, receive communion. I want want to remind you that the 
the bread or the cracker represents the body of Jesus broken on the cross for your sin. The wine or the juice, it represents the blood of Jesus shed for forgiveness. That communion itself is a powerful statement of justification. It demonstrates this work that Jesus has done for us. So as you receive the elements, you do so being able to confess your sins freely to God, knowing that in Christ you're forgiven. And remember, no wrath for you. The wrath is passed over you because of the blood of the Lamb. You've been justified by the blood of Jesus. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a reading of Scripture. We're going to read the Scripture together corporately. And then after we do that, we'll receive the elements of communion. And then we'll sing a final song together. Well, the Bible tells us the story of the First Communion in 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to actually read those verses together corporately out loud. So why don't you read this with me? This is 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. On the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Resurrection Church. My name is Peter Elliott. This is my wife, Stephanie. We are worshiping with you from the east side of Tacoma. We're super thankful for technology that allows us to be together, even though we're separate in these times. Uh, we're going to close out the service. Uh, Stephanie's going to read a benediction. She's going to read Jude 24 and 25, and then I'm going to pray us out. You want to read, Steph? Okay. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day you've given to us. We thank you so much for your love, your mercy. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and for your Holy Spirit, who you give to us to be a peace and a comfort in time of troubles, Lord. We pray that you would continue to pour out your grace and your mercy on us, and that you would bring physical healing uh, both to our region, to our country, and the world, Lord. And even more so, we just pray that you would spiritually heal us, that you would draw us closer to your Son, you'd bring those who don't know you back to yourself, Lord. Please help us be a part of your mission to bring your kingdom. Please help us to be people who love others and also make disciples. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We just want to say amen, Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks so much, guys. We were super thankful to worship with you. Uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Just make a note. Do your hair flawless. Do what? Hair is flawless. Sarah, help me. Yeah? <laughs> what are you using? I just used, I don't even know what it's called. Uh, I don't know. Some hair gel from Target. Nice, man. Um, okay. I mean, it, it won't work on my hair, so. No. <laughs> but it's cool that it's working on your hair. <laughs> I was about to call you and Sarah was like, are you gonna fix your hair? <laughs> <laughs> I've been complaining all morning about it, like hanging down in my face and stuff. She's like, yeah. oh, I'll help you. Yeah, the times of waking up out of bed and not caring how you look, when you step outside in the real world or do Google yeah. Hangout, it's over. It's over. <laughs> you gotta care about the way you look. Well, I at least can't have hair all in my eyes and like. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. That's true. All right, I'm gonna stop. People are gonna see you.